Good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to um, our seminar at Globus University. My name is Marom. I will be an MC uh, hosting and supporting you throughout today's session. So today's topic will be about driving DEI for growth and innovation. So I believe that lots of us have heard about this DEI as a buzzword, but hopefully today's our speaker will really shed some light into what it actually is, what we can do about it, and uh, how the organization also needs to take action for the real, you know, diversity, uh, equity, and also um, inclusion. All right, so before I start, I would like to um, uh, address a little bit about today's agenda, which we'll cover. So at first, we will start off with a keynote seminar by our speaker, Dr. Steele. Then we will come one of our faculty uh, to be the dialogue partner to answer some of, our, some of the questions on our behalf. Next, we will uh, end the sessions with the Q&A. So these are the questions uh, from you, you know, today's audience. We'll finish the session with a little bit introduction about who we are, uh, our, about our MBA program in particular, if this is your first time uh, knowing us, Globus University. Now then, um, in order to leave your questions, you can scan this QR code, and I will also be sharing um, the URL, the link to this uh, platform called Slido. You can leave the questions whenever uh, leading into the Q&A sessions, and uh, by that time, we will address it with today's speaker. So, uh, in the introduction of who will be joining us today, um, Dr. Jackie Steele, she is a trilingual political sci scientist. She is also an international speaker, the CEO, the founder of Enjoy Japan. And uh, stay true to the topic, she's also the president of uh, FEW Japan and governor of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Japan. So, I would like to give you a warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Steele, for joining us today. And uh, if you don't mind, please take the stage over. I will be stop sharing my screen. Great. Thank you so much, Marum. Without further ado, uh, allow me to turn to the traffic of tonight's conversation. Uh, we will be talking about DEI, and I am very excited for all of your questions and comments. This is meant to be a session where you can participate to some extent and use the chat window and use the Slido as was uh, described. Um, another way of thinking about DEI as another alternative is diversity requires democracy, equity requires empathy, and inclusion and inclusive leadership begins with the letter I, and it is personal, it starts with all of us. So I'm going to start screen share. Can you give me, show me some love? little heart reactions or thumbs up if you can actually see my screen. Did I do it right? <laughs> Wonderful. Never know if you're sharing the right screen. Thank you. And you'll notice on the bottom of the screen, I have captions and, and this is really just a mechanism for anywhere from in case I don't enunciate properly, hopefully the AI will catch that and help with a, a visual cue. Um, for people who are hard of hearing, naturally having the visuals are helpful. And for English as a second language uh, speakers, having the visual can often be helpful for oral conversation, uh, oral comprehension. So in the hopes that that's helpful. I will continue on. So tonight, uh, just to run through quick goals, um, and I'm going to start my timer, and I apologize to Christiane that I'm already taking more time because I had a beginning that was not a part of the actual presentation. Um, so we're going to we're going to get into thinking about obviously um, what does it mean to be thinking about DEI and why it is great for growth and innovation for companies, for society, democracies, for the economy, for families, for households, honestly, in all aspects, I think DEI is really exciting and it's a tool. We're going to talk about the global talent war because there's a lot of risks in the Japanese economy and there's risk factors that are created from different levels. And I think it's important for companies and CEOs and managers to understand the water that we're swimming in, in a democratic society where there's law and public policy that's in the background that is framing what's happening within companies as well. And there's a global economy that's also putting pressure on where we sit and how we are located. Um, DEI is about knowing where you're sitting and who is who you're in relationship to always. And so that relationality of the Japanese economy to other economies in Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific, but also in the world is really important. 
We'll talk DEI business strategy, my passion. And of course, we'll talk about sort of DEI leaders and what does it mean to think about how we can each take steps to integrate and apply these, these lessons. So uh, I'm gonna skip this really fast. I mean, I started this company four years ago. I decided I wanted to pivot out of political science uh, and law. I'd been in the Japanese university system for 15 years and I was thoroughly enjoying it. But at the same time, I just felt my goal was to change society and have social impact. And that meant publishing articles, doing original research, making sure that we had the best information for policymakers to make better choices around the electoral system, around gender equality laws, around competition, around how do we foster comp uh, diversity of thought in the core of our society. And that means creating more room for diversity. And I felt we were moving too glacially slow on some of these issues. And it felt I could have more impact if I was speaking directly with CEOs and I could maybe not worry so much about public policy, leave that to elected leaders. Uh, move away from the research intensive side of things um, and to really work with corporate leaders who I was realizing were really, really interested in this topic, really paying attention. And it was so exciting to find that interest. We incorporated just last year. Uh, I have a team, amazing team of interdisciplinary uh, backgrounds, diversity. We walk the talk. We're intersectionally diverse women, men, non-binary, LGBTQ, straight, uh, um, you know, multiple nationalities, language groups, uh, you name it, lived experiences, family formations. Some are living in Canada, the United States, and Japan. And we really work geolocation neutral to try and really leverage all it is that we experience in our own diversities. I'm gonna encourage you just so that we can take stock of who's in the room and what are the diversities, the identities and the roles or hats that you hold dear and that you think are important to your happiness, to your freedom. Can I encourage you to go into the menti.com and you can enter the code uh, 81715261. And I think, you know, Marom, if you're able to also drop the link, there's a link that you could just click through to the chat if that's easier for you. And we will reveal that later, but it's just giving us a sense of who's in the room. What identities, responsibilities, hats, what defines you? How do you self-define? What are those leverage points in, in how you understand yourself? And we'll take stock of who's in the room. All the superpowers that are present. And again, maybe you can show me the love or give me a thumbs up when you are done. And as people continue, maybe if you want to take a photo of the screen, but I think the link is also in the chat for you. So I'm going to proceed to our next section of our next. And in case you didn't see that, I'll leave that for one second. We're going to now talk about what is the water that we're swimming in? And there's a funny analogy. Some people like it. Some people think it's, you know, a little bit too, I have children who are five years old and I shouldn't probably repeat this, this joke, but there's an idea that says, and for those of you who have children, <laughs> I think you'll understand um, the logic of this. When you pee in one part of the pool, you end up peeing in all parts of the pool. So when little kids are you know, in the pool and we're unfortunately can't hold it in, it's not just limited to that part of the pool, right? It's spreading to the whole part of the pool. And I like to think about inequalities as the pee in the pool in some ways. It is the toxin. It is the inequality factor. It is the lack of tolerance. It is the lack of freedom for certain groups of people. Um, that is a toxin across the whole ecosystem. Um, and there are certain inequalities and risks and vulnerabilities that act like toxins in an ecosystem and in an economy. And so I want to just start by identifying some of those risk factors that the Japanese economy is living through and that corporate actors would want to just have on their radar because it affects the talent crisis and it affects the brain drain and it affects the ways in which we as companies working in different companies can recruit talent, acquire talent, and then keep our talent because there's an intense competition for talent and uh, Japan has certain superpowers and strengths, but it has certain weaknesses and, and, and um, factors that limit its competitive edge. So right here we see, um, this is uh, 
a study by um, the Swiss Institute for um, Management. And of course, they're looking at different types of readiness of the economy. So Japan is coming in at an overall performance of around 39. Um, and that's a combination of scores across, you know, investment and development in the, in the economy, uh, core research and development, the appeal of the market, which is gauged by a variety of factors, but also readiness. And the readiness measurement is actually often looking specifically at the quality of the skills and competencies that are available in the country, particularly for um, the availability of senior managers with significant international experience and language skills. So there's a variety of indicators that this is measuring, but I would just say this is one area in which the Japanese economy has in some ways moved below other countries in Asia. So Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, Malaysia have pulled ahead of Japan. And when we're thinking about the Indo-Pacific and Asia Pacific, this is a challenge. We wanna be mindful of the fact that when talent and mobile talent has choices, they're thinking about where do I want to go in Asia? Um, how do we attract them across to Japan to live in this wonderful place with us? So this is on the minds of how we understand talent readiness or talent recruitment opportunities and sort of the background context. Other risk factors, of course, won't be a surprise for many of you is that the Japanese labor force is shrinking. We know this. Population decline has, has been combining up with extreme gender inequality. And we have both a gender gap of 120th internationally, uh, which is a which is a you know a pressure cooker in terms of 50% of our talent we're not leveraging for innovation and growth, and the diversity of the lived experiences and original ideas in 50% of our population, pretty pretty damaging to how we manage to get the best of all the market has to offer and the talent pool on the market has. If you take uh, the approach that all social groups are meritoc meritocratically equally given, you know, different types of genius and high skill and different levels of competencies and superpowers and unique perspectives, if all social groups are blessed with that equally, uh, then not leveraging 50% of one of the groups is, is going to be a, a challenge. And that's, that's just one data point that we're looking at. But in terms of net population decline, we know that Japan's population went down 4% in the last 20 years, and it's going to go down 12% in the next 20, 20 years. So this is a shrinking pie of talent. And the competition is on. So game on is your company ready to be out there really competing for this talent all of the talent on the market. And this is just an interesting background. I mean, I think the funnel is interesting from the perspective of women's empowerment or women's equal um, access to excellent upward mobility jobs within companies where they can really shine and leverage their unique perspectives and radical individuality as well. You know, we're looking at all women and girls being 65 million shrinking down to 54 adult women, shrinking down to 30 million as actually women in the labor force. Again, a shrinking down to just under 12 million who hold full-time permanent positions. Only 12 million are in the full-time permanent. We're talking seishain, right? Seishain are the roles that go have upward mobility and career track. Contract workers, you know, irregular work. There is a huge gap when we're thinking about women in the, lab, in the labor force of the 30 million that's available, but then what actually is being leveraged in companies is really the 12 million because that's the Seishine, that's the career track with the upward mobility. So a lost opportunity there. And of course, we're not surprised that then the, the percentage of women in managerial is within a subset of that, right? So this is the context within which we're working. The percentage of women on boards are also very low. And really because often boards are recruiting from their career track inside their companies a lot of the time. So why are we surprised? If we wanna move beyond, move the dial on corporate boards, we need to be thinking about outside the box. We don't need to look at just talent within corporations. And, and what companies have generally done is, okay, we'll recruit in some academics who are women 
or lawyers who are women, right? But we can also think about diversifying that pool of excellent women who are women who are entrepreneurs and CEOs of small startup companies and or women who are longtime members within the nonprofit board sector. They've been volunteer, uh, unpaid or very minimally paid nonprofit board of directors, uh, directors who have governance experiences. They know how to balance a budget. They have fiscal, they understand their fiscal fiduciary responsibilities to the mission of the organization they're serving. Um, it's just a different scale and scope perhaps, but the transferable skills are there. So we need to get creative thinking outside the box to diversify our understanding of excellence and what skills are we leveraging and why. And we obviously, I would always say, we're driving for a diversification of thought. Thought, diversity of thought and diversity of lived experiences, professional backgrounds, multilingual backgrounds, understanding different customer bases, industry sectoral diversity. All of that is what we're looking for. Again, if we're honest about the Japanese economy and the crunch we're facing, there are additional risk factors that plague the population in Japan. And long working hours culture is in a shift and the pandemic has had a certain silver lining, right? Where sometimes that means we're not doing FaceTime in an office for 10 hours a day. Maybe it means we're chained to our desk at home because we're working from home and we don't know when to turn it off. <laughs> How do, we, how do we rein in the Japanese work ethic <laughs> to be carving out space for work-life balance so that we can be sustainable leaders and sustainable employees and sustainable talent and sustainable fathers and sustainable mothers and sustainable households? And this is the crunch right there. How do we think about the culture of individual self-sacrifice? It is not helpful. Other countries don't have it. Japan has it. How do we rein this in somewhat? How do we rein in the gaman culture, right? Economic stratification is something that has been exacerbated over the years. We're no longer looking at everyone in Japan as part of the middle class and consider themselves part of the middle class. That's no longer the case. And so how does that change the sense of inherent equality that we used to have across most of the population in Japan? How do we think about the insanely high rates of suicide, both for men and women, internationally high, and that's a population loss. That's a precious talent pool. If we're thinking about these things, it's a precious lives, of course, but it's also talent that has been educated, has come through society, has been you know, reaching certain ages of, we need to be building and gardening that talent forward. And yet there is a sense of loss of hope that leads to choices that unfortunately mean a loss of life. How do we correct for that? How do we invest differently in nurturing our talent? in mental health, obviously, supports. And of course, the declining birth rates. And this is combined with the intense densification of population in major cities of greater Tokyo, Kansai region, in major cities, and tremendous earthquake risk. What happens when we have a magnitude nine in Tokyo, where all of the headquarters are for major companies? How is it that we're not thinking about diversifying our economic bases and headquarters across the country so the risk factors are not all in one easy spot for an earthquake to take out? I've done disaster risk for 10 years as an academic. It's a scary thought that keeps me up at night. Why are all the headquarters of all the major companies all clustered in Tokyo? So these are the risk factors that are in the backdrop of what companies are dealing with. So when we think about DEI, I just want to set the stage for we can, we can deal with some of the DEI conversation, the diversity, the equity conversation, the inclusion factor. But these are coming out of a public policy framework that intensifies risk in terms of macroeconomic policy making. So I guess one of the things I'm suggesting is an invitation to corporations to think about corporate citizenship, to think about what would be the public-private partnership we need for a dialogue, a more intense dialogue and debate across corporate leaders and political leaders about how we change the public policy landscape in Japan to alleviate some of these risk factors that law and public policy can solve in a very activist way. So turning our attention now to the DEI industry. I've been in Japan a very long time, arrived off the boat, 1997, and I was literally inserted into a local municipal government with the mandate of bringing internationalization to my city government. Um, and this was in some ways the 1980s, 90s boom, right? In some ways, if you think about it, it was a diversification strategy through the Ministry of Education to bring foreign talent, young foreign talent, 
those who could speak and read and write Japanese went into Japanese local governments across the country, 5,000 of us. Within that, 90% were English language teachers sent into the classrooms of the country to bring new ideas, to diversify through language acquisition. This is kind of the first DEI light, right? We're trying to diversify and bring new ideas forward. The second generation, and, and challenges was that it was like one person, right? I was one person working to serve a 40,000 citizen base city. And I was the only foreign woman in my city expected to internationalize, right? And I did my best, I worked very hard for three years. And, and we did make a lot of change and a lot of institutionalized change that still lives in my city today, 20 years later, 25 years later, where I'm still living. And that my children benefit from, ironically. But so second generation approach was not sort of internationalization through bringing in you know, foreign nationals, it was sort of adding women and stirring through the womenomics strategy. That the economy could be fixed if we could just bring women in to paid labor. But women and one woman here and one woman there is really not a strategy. And it doesn't institutionally drive shifts of power. Because shifts of power, if you're a political scientist, you know, follow majority minority dynamics. And you need a majority critical mass that can shift, which means you really need to have numerical hegemonic majority bodies and people voting for a certain direction or a certain number in the, in the company really driving a change. It can't just be one person being the single by themselves lone wolf catalyst. It doesn't work that way. Change management is slow and gradual and needs a majority. Third generation approach is in some ways running unconscious bias training, which, you know, you, you walk away learning about all the different forms of bias and of, you know, of unconscious bias, but what do you do with that knowledge? Does it change your habits? Does it fundamentally change your behaviors? Maybe, maybe not. But from a company perspective, it downloads responsibility to each individual in the company. When we're building, really trying to build an ecosystem shift that is institutionalized and structural, not individual led. So moving forward, then how do we think? Oh, let's let's circle back actually, and I'm gonna I've brought this slide back because I thought we would take a moment there. I'm gonna take a look at the chat and I wanted to just be able to share the results. And I think, you know, what's exciting is everyone has a different way to think about their roles, their identities, their core hats or responsibilities and what makes their happiness, what really is important to their happiness or to their freedom. And that's a plus for the economy, that's a plus for corporations, that's a plus for families. These are the superpowers in my mind. These words speak to the superpowers that are in the room. It's what drives us. It's what we find motivation in. So when we think global citizen, cosmopolitan, revolutionary, husband, passionate, ethics, ambition, art, freedom. And the bigger the word, the more times it's been named. So that's why some of the words are a little bit bigger. So we have quite a few fathers in the room. We've had people who value freedom, who think about the global and who bring passion as sort of an overlapping. And then we've got a lot of diversity in the smaller words. Language, multifaceted, was born and lived in Japan, business owner. Sujido one, I'm not sure how to interpret that. <laughs> Respect, was Korean, pansexual, manager, supportive, learner, friend, doer, feminist, direct, creator, hope, happiness, non-binary, woman, strategist, challenge, man multicultural, multi-ethic, just amazing. So I'm gonna encourage all of us to think about this as the superpowers in the room and to think about doing this activity with your teams. It's really easy, it's a free app, it's participatory, people only disclose what they're comfortable sharing. And it gives you a sense of what are the superpowers under the tip of the iceberg is what you see, the visible diversity, what you see of people on face value. 
The rest is living under the water. It's the tip of the iceberg. And that's the deeper part that I think is what's really important for innovation, creativity, and driving radical individuality to contribute in really exciting ways. So DEI business strategy, how are we moving the dial? And how are we moving the needle in terms of what we can do? And I, I would suggest to you that this is the seven components that I talk about as DEI business strategy. And for me, DEI is not a nice to have. It is not something you do when you have some extra chair, you know, change in your pocket. Um, it's not a one-off event. It is business strategy. And if you've understood the context of the talent crunch, the talent war, the declining population, the lack of leveraging diverse talent across the Japanese economy. Wow, do we need a diversity equity for innovation? And we say diversity and equity for innovation, business strategy that is strategic. So what are the strategic areas? Leadership responsibility is the first one. You begin with the top and it sets, I mean, what CEO is gonna leave strategy, <laughs> core business strategy? to another part of the company uh, without being actively a part of caregiving that. I'm not sure. I would suggest that for my own company, it was certainly something that I definitely always care gave. That was a top priority. It's, it's connected to employer branding, of course, how you shine and show up in the world as a leading company, what people think about what you're doing in the world, how you innovate in terms of your customer services or your solutions or what you're, how you're moving the market. The ideas that you can, can bring forward, that, that gives a halo effect, right? Of employer branding and that drives higher engagement of your employees because they're excited to be working on what they're working on. Um, it mean, brings talent much more easily into your pipeline because they're like, ooh, that's a cool place to work. I wanna work there. Um, you need to maintain it with psychological safety because and this is why I talk about, you know, DEI and the democracy by stealth issue is if you've got a hierarchical structure and a corporation that's got hierarchical culture, I can take and I can visibly say we're going to do a really aggressive strategy to diversify. We're going to bring a whole bunch of diverse folks and we're going to diversify all the way from entry level, you know, positions all the way up. We're going to diversify them all. And in a hierarchical culture, who decides? Generally, the decisions are mostly taken at the top. And people below, lower on the ladder are not really encouraged to weigh in as much with their individuality, with their ideas, to contest and challenge, to say, hey, I think you're wrong. I think the CEO is completely you know, off his rocker and has got it wrong, and I think I have a better idea. You're not leveraging all of that diversity if it's a more top-down hierarchical culture anyhow, because people start realizing that if I speak up and I get it wrong, that's career suicide. So I think I'm just gonna be quiet and I'm just gonna like read the air on what other people are saying. And I'm gonna look at what my senior managers are saying. And then I'm gonna look at, and, if, and maybe I'll just say, I'll just go along with what they think because I don't want to, I don't want career suicide to be the price I pay for taking a risk and sharing my opinion. And so we're inevitably shutting down the whole leverage point of individuality across the ecosystem if we don't flatten our culture to be a much more psychologically safe, dynamic competition of ideas, collegial disagreement, being a part of our culture. We need low employee turnover to build institutional memory and help talent move up the pipeline and bring all of their memory of what the company's products and services and solutions are doing and why, and why we didn't choose other options 10 years ago. When someone else says, hey, we should go back to doing it this way. We want people in the pipeline who are part of those debates and discussions and remember. And we need to think about how that's connected up to building a sustainable form of innovation that keeps us moving forward and high team performance. I'm just gonna take a flash of this really quickly, but just to say attitudinally differences in terms of where, you know, yes, CE suite, um, you know, the study from, from this, um, you know, survey is really of executives in the major Japanese companies. And the availability of talent is a vital factor of innovation. 82% of Japanese executives, they get it, right? But then talent management and C-suite executives are responsible for talent management, not really their job, not really their job when really this is a key part of now in a talent crisis and brain drain to across Asia Pacific, this is really business strategy, this is core. This is just looking at a better up survey on how we understand, you know, employees who feel like they're really belonging 
167% more likely to recommend the organization and bring in their friends and family who are smart and should be in the company. Talk about building your pipeline in a really easy win-win way. And on the flip side, you know, a single instance of a microaggression, just one instance of a microaggression, and that declines an individual's performance by 25% because they're distracted. They're in a mental model of fight or flight because now they feel under attack socially and mentally and psychologically by the person who they're worried they're gonna run into again at the water cooler or in a Zoom room, and they're distracted. They're not performing as much. And they're gonna be distracted in terms of their performance with their team. So these are just baseline little snippets of ideas about why this matters. What is the bottom line hit to the company when you're not having effective people empowered to do their best work? This is just talent turnover costs in terms of you know, 600,000 hard costs. Um, and we know that with microaggressions increasing, then you know, you're know you onboarded, the cost of talent acquisition, the cost of onboarding for a year, getting them functional and sort of competent in their role, you're paying their salary the whole time. Maybe they really start to perform in year two, and then there's some microaggressions, there's a lack of psychological safety, and by year three, they're walking out the door. They're, they're gone. So then how do you get out of the, the leaky bucket of spending all this money on talent acquisition, right? When you can solve psychological safety in the company instead. So I'll go just to one scenario, and then I think I would like to hand over um, so that we can think about, and I can come back to some of these other pieces and slides when there's questions and answer. Just a big scenario. I mean, this happens all the time. You know, your department's received an approval for team building, and so they decide they're going to do a bouldering event. And to promote the trip, your coworker starts handing out flyers during working hours. You notice they're making an effort to encourage the women in the team to enjoy the activity too and to have fun by really trying out the beginner level course and, and feeling that, you know, you definitely, you know, I think you will find it fun. How would you handle the situation? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. So why only encourage women, persuade women to join without judgmental judgment? Why specifically women without, oh, sorry, why only beginner course? Would it, would it be indifferent about it? Not sure that highlighting beginner is such a good idea, assuming women don't rock climb. Can understand only focus women. Why is it assumed that women cannot be already talented at bouldering? Why beginner shouldn't assume they're beginners? <laughs> Scheduling for convenience, help her by all her colleagues, didn't know how to do bouldering, different activities. Maybe that is more inclusive than bouldering. Listening from the members is the key. Asking them what they want would be nice. Excellent. Really nice, really nice reflections. Thank you for that. And you can continue to put more in there. I'll come back and sort of talk about how we think about this in the enjoy modality. So to get to that point, I just want to take a moment and just sort of show how we approach this from an evidence-based data-driven perspective as enjoy methodology. We start with unlearning bias through intersectional thinking. This is a Canadian best practice in public policy and law. We collect intense disaggregated data in our census reports in our measuring our population in Canada. We know our population to get really granular. And it's all aggregate data, so it keeps you know, the anonymity. But then we go in and we use intersectional thinking to think, figure out where the systemic inequalities are so we can think backwards and say, how do we want to mitigate inequalities? And so the first thing we talk about is how do you unlearn your bias? Systemic bias. Not this is affinity bias, this is you know, all the different types of bias at a knowledge transfer, but how does bias function across an ecosystem? How do we disrupt it and dismantle it so that we're changing the ecosystem for good beyond the one individual's presence in the company? We move from that to then thinking about psychological safety and attuned is our best uh, tool for measuring the intrinsic motivation that each individual has that's very different across a team, each individual is different and seeing the core culture gaps across diversity of motivation for work. What makes you tick? What makes you feel like you wanna work hard? Uh, what is it? Is it that you need progress? Is it that you need lots of support, supportive feedback? Is it that you want high autonomy? What are those indicators? We also then think about EQ leadership because senior most roles need the senior most effective competencies in emotionally intelligent leadership to motivate and know how to nurture teams. And we build and we leverage leadership teams to then think critically about business strategy and then to actually work with us and co-create a very diversity positive, equitable company corporate culture and systems that support that and virtuous cycle 
incentivize good behavior and healthy habits across the organization. So that's the intersectionality lens that we use. And I'll come back to this for lack of time right now. We can come back and go more in depth. Attuned is, as I said, looking at diversity of motivation in individuals, and there's 11 core motivators that we talk about, and that helps managers be more effective and targeted in how they manage and pe people manage, be coaches, uh, support their team so that there are no microaggression, microaggressions from managers in particular. We say that people don't generally quit their company, they quit their manager. So that's a really important intervention. We sometimes again follow up, as I said, with more uh, focus on the emotionally intelligent leader using an international best practice out of Toronto, Canada, again, on an emotionally intelligent leadership assessment. And those are the tools that we find are evidence-based and allow for self-reflection, but also reflection together in teams as leaders, trying to co-create change that is meaningful and lasting and will drive inclusive innovation and steady competitive edge and performance for good. That is where we're headed for and when we're thinking about diversity and equity for innovation. So the DEI business approach, when we think about you know, that scenario, we'll come back to right now just really quickly. And, and a lot of your comments were really dead on. Of course, you know, maybe it's something that you could do in private as an employee to employee, you would say, you know, why are we making assumptions about women's inexperience in bouldering or that women are unathletic or that women aren't able to handle that? That can be a private conversation, an upstander conversation. Um, oh, I got a note that my captions are off and I missed the chat. I will come solve this now. Thank you for that. Solidarity, appreciate it. There we go. Okay, thank you so much. And another approach is of course, you know, talking to your HR director. Um, is everybody physically able to boulder? Is there a reflection on whether that, you know, activity is going to work with people with disabilities or mobility challenges that actually you don't disclose? Maybe you don't even know they have them. And those types of conversations are confidential, so only the HR uh, leaders will know that. So the people, you know, doing the team building really probably need to check in and make sure they're getting guidance on are we thinking inclusively across all different types of our, the needs in our group? Things that can be spoken about on record and things that are confidential. Um, of course, from a de design culture, how is parallel play? If we're all building, you know, climbing the wall separately together, how does that build, how is that good for team building, right? How do we make sure that we're thinking about what we're proposing is actually having positive benefits for the KPR we're trying to achieve and tick a box on, which is team building. Team building, of course, if we're just doing parallel, parallel play and, and then climbing separate walls, maybe not the best design in terms of being evidence-based and measuring. What are we trying to get? How are we measuring team building improvements? How are we deepening relationships and psychological safety? And of course, having a committee process that's more inclusive to include all different types of workers who are interested can be another way that you just get a better diversity of ideas coming forward rather than one or two people being given that and sort of paternalistically deciding it for everybody. So that's the little scenario on how we would leverage an intersectional thinking across, you know, diverse abilities, diverse bodies, diverse mobility issues, invisible things that you don't know are going to be a limitation, um, as well as, of course, um, just assumptions that we're making across uh, gender and other types of areas. We'll come back to this because I think um, maybe I'd like for us to morph into the next phase of our dialogue um, and thought partnering about DEI with um, the wonderful thought partner here this evening from Globus joining tonight. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity. And then we can come back to looking at these ideas around what are the individual steps that we each can do more of, and you feel free to take a photo of this screen if you'd like for your own reference later, but we will come back to it during the question and answer period. So on that, I'd love to take a pause and hand back over to Manu. Thank you so much, Dr. Steele. I was imagine being handed that flyers too and really <laughs> thought seriously about it. But the fact is, this is us being 
unconsciously biased in so many li- level. I, I think it's uh, layers on top of layers on top of layers. So I'm not even sure what I'm feeling is a bias toward myself. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> so I would like, uh, we would like to move into a more you know, interactive part. And uh, the next session will be a dialogue. And I've shared this uh, URL that you can send in your questions to Dr. Steele anytime during you know, this dialogue. We'll touch upon your questions uh, after this session. But with no further ado, I would like to welcome our very own uh, Megumi. If you are studying at Globis, you may have already taken or will be taking her accounting classes, cross-cultural management classes. So that is why she can you know, represent us <laughs> in this today topic. But uh, she's a um, you know, Globis faculty and also chief of our researcher. So um, Megumi, uh, please take it away. I'll, sh- I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen. Thank you so much, Aung, for the introduction. And thank you so much, Jackie, for a great presentation. There's a lot of useful and a new information for me. So I, I, need, I really want my own time to digest uh, and all, all the ideas that I'm getting. Yeah, so uh, meanwhile, I, I, I like to uh, think about the focus about dialogue. And then and I, I don't want to preempt all the great questions that we, we are receiving on Slido. So I, I'm carefully avoiding those questions. The, the, the question that I also have in mind, but I'm trying to uh, kind of frame uh, conversation uh, in a broader sense. So, uh, you know, one of the things that, that's, that was uh, important is to understand context uh, so oh, oh, mo- most of us here are business person and and then we we think about DEI in a corporate context but we need to understand those public policy issues mm-hmm. and social uh, context to understand so then you have very sad data to show with uh, share with us about Japan and for always <laughs> showing how how bad we are in this moment then and, you know I think and uh, uh, one point you must have felt really helpless in a way working mm-hmm. on this country <laughs> having all the bad signs and no sign of a great improvement how do you so this uh, kind of sense of resignation is also contagious when i in you know, having this discussion with di so uh, sorry to start with this kind of uh, negative point but how do you and deal with this kind of sense of negativity? I like a challenge. (laughs) Great. (laughs) And I think, you know, many would say that there are are no problems, there are only opportunities, right? Um, And I do, you know, over the last uh, 25 odd years in Japan, living in rural Inaka, Nagano, and in northern Tohoku, and working with women, you know, feminist movement, law reformers who are working hard to educate the population and working with parliamentarians and following the changes of grassroots women in Tohoku post-disaster, rebuilding their communities. um, I see such tremendous leadership at all levels of Japanese society, at the grassroots and across different spaces, sectors, industries, nonprofit sector, um, educational sector, universities within the university system, there are pockets of leadership just bubbling in all of these sectors. And I think, and if you look at the, the general attitudes and the public opinion surveys of Japanese people, there's a tremendous openness to diversity, to having more immigration, to having foreign nationals and foreign talent come, to having more women in all different types of roles, to having LGBTQ inclusion and diversifying the family beyond what it has been sort of stuck in under the, under the family registry. There is tremendous appetite for social change that I have witnessed in the last 25 years. <laughs> I think where there's a challenge is there's a bottleneck in parliament and it's challenging to get law reform through to support those social changes to be really solidified, institutionalized through public policy and law, and then generally genuinely supported as a really systemic change um, that is perhaps more political elite led. 
And I just think that's a challenge for democracy. That's a challenge for representative democracy in my sort of analytical way. If there's a gap between what elite political leaders are suggesting is needed for the company and what the population for the company for the country and what the population is asking for, we need to close the gap. And we, we need for a police, you know, the political elite to be better listeners, to understand what the population is really having an appetite for and wants Japanese society and economy to grow and become dynamic and to be innovative and to have entrepreneurialism flourish, right? We're looking for that in the people of Japan. So I think all nations go through change. And if we look at history over time, all great nations have an ebb and flow and there's moments of legacy building and shining. And then there are periods of decline and decay and, and things are more challenging. And I think we're, we're looking towards, I'm certainly looking towards the Rewa era to being an uptake if we can get this leadership bubbling up from the grassroots, deriving elite attitudes to evolve forward and allow for law reform and corporate leadership to really drive uh, a more systemic shift that's meaningful and permanent. Right, 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 exactly. So um, while you know, DI is a leadership, um, issues and, and then the leadership challenge. But so while expecting pushing leaders to take this subject seriously, we can also think as an individual how we can be part of uh, building a uh, better DI in our country and, and that's a grassroots movement. And then most of uh, the participants we have in, in this uh, seminar tonight are mainly uh, middle managers. And they are great middle managers, believe me, because they are in many of them are in, in my class and they're really serious about you know, a, a creating a great impact in the societies and in the businesses they are running. So, and you mentioned something, uh, the keyword, uh, corporate citizenship, mm. right? So then it's social, so, so DIA is a social change, but business is a big part of our society and economy. So, and there's mm -hmm. a great role business can play and then a For great sure. role middle managers can play. And when you say corporate citizenship, what kind of thing that, what kind of outcomes that you are expecting from that? Well, and I think when I think about corporate citizenship, it's really a logic of <clears throat> how do corporations want to understand their legacy in the country that they are a part of. Um, if we're thinking about a, you know, a stakeholder approach and a multi-stakeholder approach to capitalism, um, and really you know, going back to, I think, some of the roots of, of what Japanese capitalism and the roots of multi-stakeholder capitalism and having a societal approach, what is the impact we have, not just for our shareholders, but also for the whole of society? That's one angle, I think, on corporate citizenship. I think the other angle can be in terms of how our, our, our leaders are taking, are having voice, having voice and engaging parliamentarians and political leaders about what is the kind of change we really need to see more of in the country to alleviate the risk factors, the vulnerabilities we talked about, the slides I showed. How do we get Japanese economic performance to be up and really um, competitive again in Asia, in Indo-Pacific? Um, how do we get a, a sort of a movement of corporate leadership that is working with, with a political leadership to think about that rebuilding process and voicing? voicing up. I mean, democracy is about having voice. Middle managers need to have voice. And this is the challenge when you're in a, perhaps a, a company that maybe isn't as flat as you'd want. Maybe there's not as much psychological safety. Maybe it is more top down. How do you reverse mentor? How do you use, use influence? Not authority, because you might not have the authority to speak truth to power, but maybe how do you use influence to reverse mentor, to be helpful? and to have your leaders backs if they are failing on areas where you think that we could be doing better as a company, where you see a business opportunity. And I think it is using business language to appeal to the business strategy and the business value for this will make us more innovative. This will bring diversity of thought into our company. This will help us build better solutions for our diverse customer base. I think those there's tremendous opportunities for, for people managers and for middle managers to be in that modality. And at a baseline, being the change you want to see in the world starts with us being empathetic leaders and inclusive leaders in how we treat our people. Are we being top down as well? Are we shutting down the voices of those in our team? Or are we holding space for them? And are we encouraging competition of ideas, collegial dissent, 
not everybody has to think the same way. Are we about, are we setting a flourishing of that culture in our own teams? And I think each middle manager can have a tremendous influence in that. Right. So, um, um, so one of the thing about the leader. So when I have this DI. Oh, by by the way, and I'm so happy to see so many men, not only women, in this seminar, uh, because when I first started having this kind of conversation uh, through global seminars, say ten years ago, it was all women. It was like a women's club, women's getting together, talking about women issues, right? But now, I mean, I'm more uh, interested, genuinely interested in this topic and and having more. Um, equitable society in, in the business community and um, then you know then you know, I, I, I felt the need to build a strong logic in promoting DI including like it, it helps your business to save your cost <laughs> or it helps to uh, increase your performance and then all these uh, top top leaders go mm -hmm, that sounds good for for money <laughs> right it's a great financial result okay great so i was thinking about that but then it's, i still have this problem of causing them a true desire to be part of di movement right they understand logic right they, they can calculate but it is i still have a challenge of kind of a provoking true desire among them to say oh that's the society i want to be part of or oh, that's the business i like to build so uh, through your experience of speaking to uh, business leaders in 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 your uh, during your research activities did you have any moment to kind of see a breakthrough kind of touching their hearts beyond logic yeah absolutely and i think you know, when we deliver and the baseline first intervention that we have is DEI business strategy with intersectional thinking, we start with, yes, the intersectional analytics. We start with data. We work backwards and we say, why is this just irrational to be excluding all of this customer base? Why are we missing all of this customer base? Why aren't we diversifying the customer base that we could be serving and making money through our products reaching? But then we're only speaking a narrative that speaks to men, or we're only speaking a narrative that speaks to women. We're losing huge customer segment by virtue of not using intersectional thinking or intersectional analytics and saying, for whom would this product be pertinent? And then diversifying all the profiles who stand to gain from that product, that service, that, you know, modality of what we're doing in the market. And then all of a sudden you see, yes, the business goals, you see the alignment around business strategy or of what intersectional thinking can do. It also is a calling in. And so we do a very experiential workshop that is really a, having applied exercises. It's like some of what we're doing tonight where you think for yourself, I'm not going to give you the answers. If you were a student in my political science courses at university, um, you know, you will know that I will not give you the answers and I expect you to show up with your brain and do the work and think. And it's by virtue of doing the thinking and going, oh, okay, I get it, I get it. I just saw my blind spot. I just saw my blind spot. I was thinking this way. And now by virtue of realizing that we could have been reaching all these people, but I didn't diversify. I didn't think beyond the stereotypical who is most likely to buy our product and therefore we take the median you know customer segment and call it a day and tick a box and say we're done we've missed huge money opportunity on the you know money on the table so then people say they, there's this shift where they go wow i just i now see why if i could diversify the profiles constantly across everything we do and think about for whom does it serve and who have we missed and why have we missed them? What are the stereotypes in the room? Well, how are we trafficking in stereotypical assumptions or narratives or reducing women to be all one flat character, reducing men to be one flat character, reducing and denying the presence of non-binary people in our world? How is that lazy thinking costing me money? And if I close off those blind spots, how can I make a better business strategy? and show up as an actual inclusive leader. And then you're also calling in not only the business case, but that they get to therefore see a sense of pride and take a sense of pride that they can tie up business strategy and inclusive leadership to be together and to be in an allegiance 
and then to build legacy, not only for their own careers, for their own, how are they the change and being the change in their company? How are they influencing within their company, opening up the minds of people around them? I think most people wanna be seen as good people. They want to be inclusive leaders. They want people to think highly of them. So tying up that you know inclusive leadership angle, equitable leadership, but also business smart. I think those are, those are just a win-win on both sides and it's more motivating once you can get to that point and then people look at you and they admire. Yeah, you're making a lot of money. Do I admire you? Maybe not. So what are we building, right? We're building in some ways leadership. And I do think that this is all just a conversation about equitable leadership. Yeah, thank you so much. And so, you know, many of the corporations, especially Japanese corporation, um, have this, you know, a great mission of serving to everybody in the market, serving to everybody in the society and through their businesses. And if they, if they really find a real meaning in what they say as a vision, I probably they can just tie those logic and emotion together to say the eyes away, obviously, right? To flourish as a, as a business and also a part of the uh, society. Okay, so then uh, now I'd like to uh, move on to Q and A section. We got a, a number of questions coming through uh, Slido, and in, and then the people who are listening to to this, you can vote for any question that you are interested in getting answers for. And so, um, oh, would you like to um, uh, pick up some of the key questions that you saw? Sure. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll be sharing the real time uh, Slido screen. Um, so those who just typed up their questions <clears throat> will be showing here as well. And of course, Dr. Steele and uh, Megumi, if you see any questions, if you like to focus first or combine, please let me know. But um, I already see, you know, as far as the topic goes, a lot of questions about women. And uh, I can see, you know, uh, quite numbers of questions regarding that. So let's start there. Um, first, question, how can female workers find out about companies, whether they're really trying to invest for their internal female positions and condition? And it links to also, you know, regarding women's desire to climb up career ladder. Uh, we also, we, I use the word we, women also validate themselves, uh, ourselves a little bit too low. What should we do? We also got a couple questions saying that what if the bosses are a little bit senior Japanese men, what should we do? those kind of thing. Should I be picking? <laughs> what is pick, pick one that you, you like to so, tackle first. So, okay, I'm just gonna open it on actually my screen. Yeah, I guess it's hard to read there. Uh, give me one minute. Right, on actually, my screen. Can I ask a question while I'm absorbing all the questions? Can I give just a quick question to the audience? I want you to think back to the scenario I gave you of the team building exercise that was the bouldering. Can you all drop in the chat the gender of the people who are going out to promote the event? What do you think the gender is? Pop it in the chat, please. And I'm gonna give me a sense so I can read your questions and think. And I mean, that question is really just to invite you to check your bias. So there's no <laughs> one right answer, right? There's and really it is no... coming out of our our understanding. So most either people, it, mm -hmm. most people will default assume that it's men who have organized the bouldering, uh, or men who are promoting the event. It could have been that men planned the bouldering. You never know. It could have been women who planned it. But generally, the people promoting and going out to the women and saying, "Hey, you can you can enjoy this too. Try out the." It could be either. It really could be either. And I think the point there is to say women or organ you know groups social groups that have been in systems that are unequal come to internalize the stereotypes about their own group into their own core thinking they also internalize the sexism they internalize some of the misogynist views they can internalize it just as much we know that for societies that are struggling with racism internalized racism is also something that those of the marginalized group themselves can have experiences of internalized racism that they then become perpetuating racist views against certain people in their own groups we know that homophobia is internalized we know that those things 
impact all of us. And so we can't think that it is only the majority group that is a part of upholding these systems. It is something that all members of society are exposed and then internalize that socialization and all of us have to consciously check our blind spots to make sure we're disrupting the stereotypes. Um, and so it's just a sort of, uh, I guess, a cue to call upon yourselves to use your critical thinking and come take the intersectional thinking workshop, but um, so that you can be thinking so that, about disrupting those blind spots. The first thing we should know is before pointing finger to others, we should know that we are all biased, and we right. should we definitely uh, should be this helpful. habit of checking yeah. our own biases before. And we do say inclusion. Judgments. Yeah, we do say inclusion begins with I because it's too easy to to turn to to a blame game, and mm. blame is blame is a toxin in the system. It hurts everybody ultimately so how are we thinking about being a part of the solution? And just, dis, yeah, I used I used to do that. I used to. <laughs> I used to somehow enjoy pointing fingers on Oji-san, but now that you know, I know that it doesn't help at all. So <laughs> I stopped it years ago. And really, <laughs> now I, I I see them yeah. as allies, right? Because right. they really, you know, I as uh, sorry, derating in the conversation coming from my bias on Oji-san, right? I At think one it's point, such a great point. <laughs> one point, I kind of blurted it out, say, "You guys, Oji-sans, if you hate women that much, just to build a company." with men only will leave then they said no 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 please don't go we don't want to live in a society with just men only it's going to be boring so then that was a great start of conversation like okay then why don't you or we have this conversation how to make it comfortable for both of us exactly. and since then oji has been allies for me <laughs> and i do think that you know Everyone is a potential co-conspirator who you're co-opting to your vision and you're co-opting into your side of things. And mm. if we give up on them without trying, and maybe that's warranted for certain people, but maybe it's not mm. for others, we need to make decisions strategically that's not also stereotypical to say, who am I going to co-opt back? And who's co-optable? And who can I bring mm. into being a co-conspirator? And then that opens up all the different allies that we can leverage, right, in our system. The unusual suspects make the greatest teams, right, for change. Right. And then and may I take this liberty of picking one question that I, I found sure. in the uh, Slido. And then and that's the one that I often get uh, when I have this kind of DNI conversations. So um, when was that? Um, so the question was, you know, I think this this person, I almost said this lady, but I, I may be probably biased. So let's say this person said, um, how how can I make uh, my company's leadership understand the importance of DI? How can they acknowledge that? Right. So uh, th then, and I always feel the sense of anger, sense of resignation in this kind of comment. Like I'm trying so hard, and it's so obvious to me that DI is the way to go, but top leaders do not see the same picture. So how, how can I do about this? Do you have any response to this feeling? I mean, there's a reason why tonight's presentation was very data-driven and very sort of research-oriented and very much about disrupting the models and traditional ways that we think about DEI. I do believe that it's business strategy. And I think that if you're gonna do a strategy, you need to have data and you need to measure and you need to have performance and you need to have accountability. So. If we're not in that modality, then don't call it DEI. Call it a box tick. Let's not <laughs> pretend. Let's not pretend that we're doing DEI when we're really doing a one-off International Women's Day event. That's yeah. that's not DEI business strategy, right? That's not a strategy. No. <laughs> no. It's a, it's um, a compliance. More, more of a lower level of compliance, right? It's, Am I doing know, okay? Am I not? Uh, it's really just you know, it's 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 it's. Let's have an event. Let's let's do something for women. Let's say that we're showing up in solidarity with women on this one day of the year. But we don't actually think about how we're making sure that the women in our the talented women in our company are finding equitable opportunities for promotion. Are we measuring the promotion rates between men and women in our company? Do we know the data on that? Why don't we know the data on that? If we're not measuring it, it's not going to get done. It's not going to get care given. And we're not going to know that there's a major blind spot on promotion rates, women versus men, differential impacts at the same level. They come in at the same level. They've been there the same number of years and we're not measuring it. We're not thinking about DEI as an actual strategy with data, 
so that measure, is actually measure, 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 bring evidence based. Um, I mean, and I think going into the company and finding the data. I mean, I've talked to you also tonight about, you know, what is the cost of talent turnover? There's a leaky bucket syndrome. Mm -hmm. Companies, how many people are quitting every year? How many job recs are open? Do you know the data on that? What data points to the lack of psychological safety and the fact that people are jumping ship and going to where the grass is greener? And if that doesn't worry your leaders, wow. I mean, maybe you'll go bankrupt in the next five to 10 years. And that's where capitalism would say you should go. Yeah. That's free. That's market. That's market outcome. So I think that in some ways, bringing the data is one piece. I think it's 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 convincing within a logic of what the listener would find convincing, what the listener needs to move their logic. Some people want logic. Some people want data. Some people want a narrative, a personal narrative. Right. So maybe they want to hear the narratives of the women and you do a hearing with women in the company or you do a hearing with LGBTQ members in your community to say this is how they're experiencing our, cult, our corporate culture and they need the narratives. Other people, you know, everybody is, cons you know, if you think about democracy, you know, when you think about politicians, they they appeal to the voters with a lot of different tactics. Right. Diversity of tactics are, are, are key. Do you use emotion? Do you use personal narratives? Do you use experiences of discrimination or alienation by someone that that person, mm. that leader cares about? Do you use data, hard, cold facts, money we're losing? I, 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 it all. This is one of my mantras in classes if for accounting, though, but I, if you can measure it, you can manage it, right? On, on the and the flip side, if you don't measure, you can't manage it. And they're so, not going to want to measure anything that they don't care about anyhow. If it's not affecting their business or they perceive it to not be affecting their bottom line, then they will not tune into it. So I think it is thinking about what is in their self-interest of what their priorities, their value set, because we can only sway people if we're understanding mm -hmm. the audience we're speaking with. So we should bring in data science to this DI practice, right? Always, always recommend always. data science mm -hmm. and data measuring sciences. and mechanisms mm -hmm. that are well rigorous developed like like public policy in Canada like public policy at different levels of different governments it is rigorous and it is measured and there's accountability and there's KPIs and there's consequences when you don't achieve your result otherwise it, it's just kind of you know lip service mm. then I, yeah exactly then I'd like to also bring in some uh, aspects of employee activism in terms of promoting DI in the mm. in a quick way <laughs> so Many, many middle managers in, in Japanese corporations suffer from this, you know, um, disappointment, right? Like, we, we know the DI is an important thing, but that my company is so slow to adapt it. What can I do, right? Then my answer to that is, is to quit. Tell your top leader you don't like your com their, their company and you, you quit. And that's a strong message, right? What do you think of that advice? And look, I, I don't understand why you keep suffering uh, with, with, with the company who do not understand or share your values. Just quit. Well, why, why, do, why are people so afraid of quitting and finding a new place to work, new place to you know, express their own opinions? Mikumi, so actually connecting mm -hmm. to that, we got also another question. How do I detect it? that this is the right company. I guess, um, you know, all of us don't always have that exposure to understand, right, the top uh, level uh, strategy. Mm. So is this, is my company care, does my company care about DEI? Uh, okay, so can I interpret in a way that can we trust corporate uh, issuance of those reports on DEI? Well, what do you think, Jackie? So nowadays we have this, you know, uh, DEI targets, and then they report, uh, they create a report to show their progress. And do you see, do you see those uh, reports are uh, trustworthy? Was there any issue then in, in those reporting? <laughs> I think that, you know, the more data we have for talent to be shopping for companies that they want to join, the better. So naturally, public policy has a really important role there to force standards of disclosing how many, what is the gender split in terms of employment? What is the different, what is the level of multilingual talent in the ecosystem? What is the split of different nationalities in a company? Um, what is there, are there policies on record to support diverse family formations, same sex, different sex, um, single parents? What policies are on the books? I absolutely think that 
law and policy has a huge amount of heavy lift to do to create a level playing field that says all companies must disclose all of this to empower talent to make wise choices on where they're going to invest and become employees. And until we get to the point that we force companies through law and policy with con with actual you know consequences for lack of disclosure, um, at least disclosure, but more than disclosure, ideally, there's also other elements of incentivizing and rewarding for good behavior. But certainly at a bare minimum, there hasn't been a lot of active disclosure in Japan relative to other countries. So this is an area where I know we're seeing changes in Japan and that's helpful, that's positive. Um, we need to change the market so that employers don't have all the information on employees, but employees have no little to no information on the companies. That's a power dynamic that's very much in need of a, of a shift for the Japanese market. And with this talent crisis, my mm. view is that people are jumping ship. What I see is that people are absolutely jumping ship left, right and center saying, I've trusted and had in good faith uh, believe in my leader for 10 years or 15 years and it's not happening and it's not in the cards and I see only superficial you know shifts on DIY be it, wash. <laughs> be it or D DEI washing be it feminist washing be it sustainability washing green washing whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. younger talent is really values based and purpose driven right more than but even the the, the older populations are saying you know, we just had a two year pandemic. What am I on this planet and what am I on this earth for? And people in Tohoku, I watched whole populations in Tokyo say, in Tohoku after the Daishinsai, after the triple disaster, wake up and say, I almost died yesterday. What am I doing in a job that I hate with people who I don't admire and with leaders who I just don't trust anymore? And they quit and they decided to make social impact enterprises to build to mm. the Tohoku region. So there are other alternatives. And I do see people voting with their feet a lot. Mm. And the talent the talent crisis right now means it's a great opportunity right. to be we shopping should, no, we should, yeah. for options. So, right. So then... So build your transferable skills. <laughs> build your transferable <laughs> skills, right? And then true, start true. shopping. Right. If you want to follow your heart and live your uh, values, then you need to upskill <clears throat> yourself so you can you can realize your business in anywhere, right? You can be useful anywhere. And so upskilling is it's the kind of condition to follow your heart and keep yeah i mean yeah. keep your keep your security to keep your family needs met but you can be slowly upskilling for a year or two and plan when you're going to mm. leave plan a job hunt that you have another plan b or plan b c options and negotiations on the way with other employers who are right. probably want going to so, want to steal steal you across so don't get stuck and be depressed, right? Just take actions. And I do think it's about individuals reevaluating the tremendous superpowers they have. And if we go back to the word mm -hmm. collage, think about your superpowers. What is your leverage point? You are the only individual on this planet with your part particular perspective, skills, mm -hmm. experience, lived reality, and viewpoint. So how do you leverage all of that? How do you honor all of that and then contribute it all in a really you know, strategic way? Mm -hmm. Then also how to detect the company that, that suits you or that does live in the DEI way. I think my 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 advice is to meet their employees in, in a in informal setting. And that the company who are uh, serious about DI usually are very open, right? Then letting their employees to speak about the company openly, right? Share more information. Then if you cannot find anyone who's willing to talk about their company, then don't go there, right? <laughs> it's a closed, prepped culture that you, you are you are expecting. So don't go there. So and if you can find people, employees who are willing to explain and share about the company, I think it's a great sign. I think, right? I mean, the other indicators are what does their corporate board look like? Is it all groupthink? Is it all one demographic? or ha at the corporate senior most level, are they gonna be innovative? Have they been innovative in their own elite decision-making space? Have they been innovative and risk-taking and diversified there? And that should be followed by great financial performance too, right? There might it be does, some time, time lag, it, but- it is, it is correlated, right? With higher performance definitely, in terms of definitely. Um, profit margins. So it's a, it's a more viable company long-term. And yes. so then that's a better bet for your stock options. I mean, there's a lot of different <laughs> ways to think about it. Yeah, that, that, that definitely makes sense. Okay, great. Okay. All so right. yeah, on yes, 
Ah. Are, we, are we okay about the time? We're Wait. just getting so passionate about the topic and <laughs> losing sense of time. I wish we had all the hours. But uh, since we have covered quite a lot on the you know female um, diversities uh, in terms of genders and so on, we also got a, a couple of questions regarding other kind of diversities. For example, foreigners in Japan. Or there's also another question about uh, how do we, I'm not sure if it's like a di uh, diversify our efforts to, uh, in terms of segment of DEI for women, DEI for, for example, disabled, DEI for uh, religions or other beliefs, for example. So if you have any thoughts on that. And okay. I mean, I would always, the enjoy method of intersectional thinking is you never think about one group in a silo. DEI strategy requires that you think holistically and all of system approach. It's an ecosystem based systems change. So if we're diversifying, what do we have? And if you think like a social scientist, when you're doing a sample of a population and you're trying to get a broad range of views and viewpoints, do you, do you sample all of the same demographic? Do you call 2000 women between the ages of, you know, 30 and 35, and then call that a representative sample that would give us the attitudes of the whole population? No, you would never do that. You would be needing in your sample size to say, we need to get a, all of the different viewpoints on the issue that you're trying to pull on. Similarly, when you're thinking from an intersectional lens, what is the issue, the business issue that you're dealing with? Or what is the way that you're thinking about your people management? We want to be diversifying across gender diversity, generational diversity, multilingual diversity, ethnocultural slash nationality we use as a proxy for that, but ethnocultural, global mindset diversity, working in cross-cultural, interculturalism competency. We want to have diversity of professional backgrounds and expertise and leverage points in the team. If we have an all technical team and no project managers, it's not going to work. We need to be thinking about the diversification across all the competencies and viewpoints and lived realities that are going to be meaningful and then measure a diversification strategy that rolls all of them out con concurrently. People with disabilities also inc including in that. Each social group is diverse, right? Women are diverse. Men are diverse. So Non-binary people are diverse. Grouping on Japanese workers is, is not, not Japanese, a way to go. Japanese people are so diverse, right? If you think about even Japanese people as a demographic, are we talking about, do we have enough, just in Japanese nationals, do we have generational diversity in the leadership team? Do we have gender diversity in the leadership team, decision-making spaces? Do we have different types of, uh, you know, disabilities and mobility issues of how we, we interact with the built environment that changes innovation and viewpoint dramatically? Do we have um, different professional expertise? All of that, you know, different family formations. Those, if, if that's not present, all of that across your, your decision-making space, there's blind spots. There's going to be blind spots that you will miss in the analysis. You will not get a 360 degree view of all the issues. So at some point, it's not saying if we diversify and add women and tick a box, it doesn't, it doesn't shift the system. To shift culture, we need to create a climate where all differences are welcome, seen as value added to perspectival shift, bringing in unique viewpoint we couldn't get if they weren't in the room educating us. And so if all diversity points, all differences have support and are leveraged as superpowers, the whole culture is now thinking very differently. We're no longer in group think. We are in what is the leverage point that each individual, and I have about 10 diversity points I could be leveraging for my company. You see me as a woman. You see me as white, you think I'm a Canadian, whatever you're thinking. I've got about 10 things that are actually more important about what I'm going to do for my company. And you don't so see any of that, that. The most important diversity, the diversity of thought. Diversity of thought throughout all across, all, and that comes through lived experiences. You can't separate out the body and think that we're going to have this eureka, I know how to do things differently for people <laughs> with disabilities when I've never experienced that in my lived reality at all how could i possibly have expertise and, yeah, so, and insight right so i think we need a skill to unlabel ourselves and Absolutely. people around us right is any 
is any practice you do? I mean, I, you may be doing it naturally, but if someone is so used to label people, group people, is there any kind of a way to unlearn that? Is well, there any I think, advice? I think that there's a twofold questioning that you can say, <laughs> am I trafficking in stereotype when I say that? Ask yourself that question. Say the 2% mm. truth. We work in proxies, right? Our brain is tired. We're working in stereotype and grouping people into categorizations because it's efficient and rational and we're used to doing it. Law does it, policy does it, or companies do it. It is a lazy intellectual quick fix proxy. Mm -hmm. It's normal. We all do it. There's a 2% truth to that stereotype of what we've said is the proxy women are X. LGBTQ are Y, disabled are A, Gaijin are B. You know, there's a reason why there's a 2% truth, but then stop for a moment and say, that's the 2% truth. What is the trafficking in stereotypes that I've just said by virtue of saying that? And then say, if I were to dismantle that and be devil's advocate, you know, this is like lawyering 101, counter argue yourself on what did you miss? Where's the blind spot? And that's just critical thinking and being, you know, being, we would call that intersectional thinking as an active application of critical thinking to disrupt the stereotypes. How do you disrupt the stereotypes every single time you're working on a core project where you're worried there's blind spots and ask other people who are different from you, who bring a different perspective to help you find your blind spots. You can't do this in silo. We need teams for DEI. We need teams and decision-making. One person can never have all the answers or all the perspectives for a 360 view. That's the reason why we work in a team and an organization, right? If I'm a perfect, I will be working alone. <laughs> but I know that I'm not, I, I need, I need my- Wouldn't it be um, so boring though, right? It'd be so boring. It would be very boring. <laughs> by yourself. Yeah, <laughs> always myself, 100%. We, we need to I, learn, right? And right. We need to learn so much I know the results. <laughs> so yes, exactly. Yeah. So diversity really is fun. Too bad that I really wish we could, you know, extend this and continue to hear from you. We actually have a, a lot of questions as well in answer. So Dr. Still will be sharing some questions later on if you want to make Thank some comments so yes that uh, we will share back to the participants but um it is already time and i actually would like to um you know ask for our audience cooperation to share a little bit you know feedback uh, about today's event or if you have more questions please feel free as well Wonderful. right and uh, i also personally have a lot <laughs> to ask uh, but i but today i think uh, we, you know we, we learn now that dei is not just a nice to have but it's uh you know you will fall behind and you will go through failure if you do not you know strategically incorporate that into part of your life part of your career and part of the organizational uh, direction. So um, I would like to thank Dr. Steele very, very much for giving the time and offering us, uh, you know, expertise on the matter and joining Globus tonight and also uh, Megumi for, you know, um, conducting such a wonderful conversations that I really hated to cut. Thank you very much. So give a, a warm uh, virtual applause uh, to both speakers. Thank you very much. So thank you everybody for joining. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Stu. Thank you, um, uh, Megumi. Uh, 30 seconds, Dr. Stu, last message to the audience or any how we can continue to learn from you, if anything. You know, I would just say that like democratization, DEI goes in spurts and it's co-created. It takes all of us to lean in and to want to drive the change and be the change starting from ourselves. Um, so get messy, get involved, mm. be a part of the solution, right? Um, and I think absolutely we're doing this to build, yes, a more innovative society, uh, a more inclusive society, a more equitable society. I also just find it really fun. And there's the reason why, you know, my company name is Enjoy. I find this to be a lot of fun and the growth opportunities when I engage with any other one human being. Fantastic opportunity to learn and grow as a human being and to challenge my mind to think outside the box. And you just can't accomplish that alone. And companies that get stuck in group think it's like you're one individual stuck in your head. So move the dial on that and seize the opportunity for the growth and excitement and, and the enjoyable moments that I think can come out of that. Thank you very much, Dr. Still. So uh, a round of applause um, for your time and your expertise today. <laughs>